I want to talk about the book of Numbers and how it pictures spiritual warfare. The Bible calls you a soldier of Jesus Christ. You're a soldier in the Lord's army. And we can get some practical things out of the book of Numbers and talk about spiritual warfare. Back then they were doing physical warfare. Me and you are involved in spiritual warfare. Now the title of Numbers means, you know, like numbering as in a census. And it's got 36 chapters, 1,288 verses, 32,902 words. The author is Moses. The time span is 1490 B.C. to 1451 B.C. And the theme of Numbers is wandering in unbelief. Now, you need to get all this stuff down in your Bible. Have notes down in your Bible or on a piece of paper. You know, taking notes about godly things gets you prepared for spiritual warfare. It's like working out. Historically, it's this book is about numbering for war. And it's about Israel's wandering in the wilderness due to their unbelief. Devotionally, uh, it's about, you know, will you count yourself in for spiritual warfare? Will you, will they, would they count you as one of the ones that's involved in spiritual warfare? Or are you sitting on the sidelines? And also, devotionally, you're going to see some consequences of unbelief and not living by faith. Doctrinally, Israel will be back in the wilderness during the tribulation period. Now, chapter 1, the reason for the title, Numbers, and Numbers 1, 2 through 3, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers, with, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, Thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. So you see, that's why it's called Numbers. It's about numbering the people for war. If you're a good soldier, then you're going to learn your weapon. Your weapon is the Bible, the Word of God. A lot of you probably didn't know why Numbers was called Numbers, but now you do. So you want to be getting more familiar with your weapon. You want to be able to take it apart and put it back together. And that's what I'm trying to help you do, to be able to take this thing apart, put it back together, know it backwards and forwards, be able to shoot it in the dark. In chapter 5, you have the jealousy offering. Now, this is a loyalty test. In Numbers 5, 19 through 21, it says, And the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say to the woman, if no man hath lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. So the what's going on here is the husband has brought his wife to the priest because he suspects some uncleanness in her. He suspects that she stepped out on him. And now the priest is going to give her a loyalty test. She's got to drink this water. And, it, and, he's, and he says, But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse, and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, and thy belly to swell. So when she drinks that water, if she really did step out on her husband, her thigh would rot, and her belly would swell. It was a loyalty test. And what is this picture? It pictures how God is jealous over his bride, which is us. And we need to drink the water ourselves as a loyalty test to find any sin in us. The, and the Bible is that water. The Bible is called bitter. And it's compared to water. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Give your own self a loyalty test. Drink the water, drink the word, and it will reveal to you 
whether or not you've got idols or something in your life that you're cheating on the Lord with. Because you're not going to be a good soldier in spiritual warfare. You need to be a loyal, faithful soldier in spiritual warfare. Not turning aside after idols. Turn to God from idols to serve the living God. You got to drink this bitter water sometimes. Revelation 10.10 10, let you know the Bible's bitter. It made John's belly bitter when he ate it up. Now, chapter 6 in the book of Numbers, you got the Nazarite vow. And this reminds you, if you're a good soldier in spiritual warfare, you're going to be filled with, filled with the Spirit and not drunk with wine. In Numbers 6, 3 through 5, he talks about the Nazarite vow. Somebody take on the Nazarite vow. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar or wine, or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. You see, this is like Samson. Samson had the Nazarite vow. He didn't cut his hair. And you remember the story about him. You don't want to do how Samson did. You know, as a Christian... You haven't taken a Nazarite vow, but you've got some principles that you need to live by. A pr you got some morals that a, a soldier in the Lord's army needs to have. You don't need to be drunk with wine. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You need to have some standards. You need to be separate. That's what this Nazarite vow was about. It was this person being separate, a peculiar person. You need to be separate. You need to be a peculiar person. When you walk in the room, there needs to be something different about you. You need to be the one that's, that's weird and strange and sticks out. Not for the sake of sticking out, but just because you're living godly and everybody else is living like the devil. Now, chapter 9, follow the cloud. If you're a good soldier in the Lord's army, you're going to follow your captain. He is the captain of our salvation. In Numbers 9, 17 through 19, it says, And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. Now they call the internet the cloud. And it has tons of information. But the true cloud has all the information about everything. And that's the captain we follow. He's got the answer to all the questions. When we're in spiritual warfare and we need an answer, we go to the cloud. I, we, don't, I, we don't go to Google. We go to the cloud. Mark 4.22 says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be, made man, not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Because in the cloud, all the information's in there. In the Lord, he got all the information. I mean, you can't even find everything that he's got in there. Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. In his ways past finding out. He's the real cloud. He's got so much information in his cloud. If you fell in it. You would get lost for an eternity. We need to follow the cloud. Follow your captain. In spiritual warfare. Now chapter 11. If you're a soldier. Don't complain. A good soldier takes what he gets. And doesn't pitch a fit. Numbers 11, 1, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So people killed for complaining. 
A good soldier doesn't complain. He's happy to be alive. He takes what he get and doesn't pitch a fit. First Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Some Christians live a lifestyle of complaining, and that is a sin. If you're a soldier, you shouldn't complain. Chapter 12. In this chapter, you see Moses gets a new wife. And that should remind you, this story should remind you not to worry about criticism. As a soldier in the Lord's army, you're going to suffer criticism. You're going to have people that look at your life and try to find something in it that shouldn't be there. It says in Numbers 12, 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, people mostly have a problem with white and black marriages. They say nothing, but they say nothing for example, when, you know, like a missionary comes in with a Spanish or Asian wife, they just don't like the white and black marriages. Um, I don't believe the Bible teaches it's wrong to marry other races. It's not wrong to marry of another race. It's wrong to marry outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the day that we're living in, you can't, you can't find a verse that says you can't marry outside of your race. But you can find a verse that says you shouldn't marry an unbeliever. We would be better off to marry someone of a different race who is saved than to marry someone who, of the same race who is lost. But yet people would criticize, you know, a, a white woman marrying a black man. Even though both of them are saved, they would criticize that more than a, a white woman marrying a lost white man. And I don't think it, people are that believe that way are racist. I just think that's their belief. You know, I respect that belief. I respect their convictions on that. But I don't. I don't believe I can look at people that are have interracial marriage and say that that's wrong if both of them are saved. And it's it's hypocritical to say a white person can't marry a black person when you're okay with a white person marrying an Asian or a white person marrying a Spanish person. But a good soldier is going to be separate. He's not going to be yoked together with unbelievers. As it talks about in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. If you're going to be a good soldier in the Lord's army, though, you're going to just take criticism and keep going. And that's what Moses did. But, you know, this scenario here, this is where the, as I said, Hollywood copies the Bible. What do you have? You got Moses taking a wife of a, another race and his family's mad about it. There's movies that copy that very thing. A person uh, takes somebody of a different race and their family's mad about it. Now, chapter 13, facing the giants. A good soldier in the Lord's army is going to face the giants. He's not going to fear men. In Numbers 13, 23, it says, And they came into the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. So they, so they cut down these grapes. And the grapes of this land in the, of the giants was so big that two people had to carry it upon a staff. So the, the fruit of the land was huge. It was great. In Numbers 13, 33, it says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are, are well able to overcome it. Caleb saw the giants himself and knew he was able to go in and possess the land because the Lord would be with him. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were 
in their sight. So this is a land of giants. In Deuteronomy 3.13, it says, And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. So back then, there was a land of giants. And you got to be like Caleb and Joshua. If you're going to succeed in spiritual warfare, you're going to have to be like these guys. They they were not afraid. And, I mean, they, they saw the cities themselves, cities that had fences that went up to heaven. In Deuteronomy 9, 1, 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. These giants were great and tall. They were a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Anak? So they were great and tall. They had a, a scary reputation about them. Sometimes somebody's reputation can even make them scarier than they actually are. I mean, they were not BFGs like Disney came out with. They weren't big, friendly giants. It says there in Deuteronomy, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly. As the Lord has said unto thee, Speak not thou in thine heart after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go up to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations." The Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they weren't big friendly giants. They were wicked, and that's why God was going to deliver them into the hands of Israel. Another thing, the giants possibly lived a long time. Notice that these giants are the Anakims. They are the children of Anak. The father of Anak, Arba, was around during Abraham's day. It says in Joshua fifteen thirteen, And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the, Lord, of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. So Arba was the father of Anak, and Arba was alive around the time of Abraham. As it talks about in Genesis 23, 2, And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. So it seems they had long lifespans like the men in the book of Genesis. However, they also degenerated over time. And that's, you're going to start seeing the degeneration of the giants. Look at Deuteronomy 3.11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits the breadth thereof after the cubit of a man. You can see Og's height was over 12 feet tall. And then Goliath came 450 years later, and Goliath is only nine and a half feet tall. That's a pretty big difference. Then in 1 Samuel 17, 4, where David is fighting Goliath, it says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And a span. So a cubit is 18 inches. And the span is the distance between your thumb and little finger with your hand fully extended. So there you have about a, a half a foot, six inches. Also notice that David comes with, with, with one staff. And when he approaches, he approaches Goliath, yet Goliath thought he had more than one. Was Goliath cross-eyed? David comes with one staff in 1 Samuel 17, 43, when he approaches Goliath. Yet Goliath thought he had more than one. In 1 Samuel 17, 43, And the Philistine said unto David, 
And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The fact that Goliath was taken down by a rock shows he wasn't too bright. In 2 Samuel 21, 16 through 22, you got this giant named Ish, Ishbibinab. It says, an Ishbibinab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So he had a new sword. I think you need to stick with the old sword. The King James, Hebrews 4.12. But this picture's, you know, one of these big, uh, real big scholarly guys that got a lot of knowledge coming at you with a new sword. But you're sticking with the old one. And then you got a guy, a giant who has six fingers and six toes. That's an intimidating guy. That giant named Saf. You know, these... You see a degeneration of the giants. Got some deformities going on. And, you know, the, the these these giants, they, they obviously could run fast. Because in Job 16, 14, it says, He breaketh with me breach upon breach. He runneth up on me like a giant. He ran up on him like a giant. So the big things in this life, they run up on you sometimes, just like Job talks about. But those were the giants that Israel was facing. And that's why they were so afraid, many of them was, except for Joshua and Caleb. And the fact that they wouldn't go in and possess the land, this is why they had to wander 40 years. That way, the ones that were older than 20 years old, 20 years and older, the ones that were, you know, adults, they had to die off. God had them wander around so that that generation would die off, and then he would let that next generation go in. And in chapter 14, it says, in 1429 through 34, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bury your whoredoms, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So eleven days turned into forty years, because Deuteronomy one two says there are eleven days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. But instead of eleven days it takes them forty years, God punishes them and makes that generation die off. So they wander 40 years and don't go in to possess the land. So the first generation didn't go, get to go in to possess the promised land. The second generation did. And this pictures how the second birth is better than the first birth. Your second birth was better than your first birth. When you got born again, that was better than the first time around when you were born of your mother. In chapter 15, you got a guy that's stoned for picking up sticks. And in spiritual warfare... This should remind you, don't even stray a little bit. Don't stray a little bit. Chapter 16, you got Korah's journey to hell. So you got the journey to the center of the earth before Brendan Fraser was even thought of. That's where they got all the ideas for these movies. And in spiritual warfare, <coughs> this should remind you, don't forget that men are going to hell. Men are going to hell every day. Just like Korah and all that appertained unto Korah, it says in Numbers 16.33, He went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. You got people that are going to hell daily. Every second, a soul drops off into hell. You have to remember that in spiritual warfare. You have to remember to give out the gospel. You have to remember that that's why the devil is fighting us, because he wants those people to go to hell. In chapter 20, you got water from the rock. 
And this should remind you how God will give you supplies. He will give you what you need to keep going. He just wants you to serve him, and he will give you what you need. And you also need to remember that that rock pictures Jesus Christ and the water. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And then John seven thirty eight, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So there you have it. The rock and the water picture Jesus Christ. And he supplies our real need. And then he's going to give us supplies to keep this flesh going. He's all that you need. Now chapter 21, you got the serpent on a pole. In spiritual warfare, you're going to come to points where you're going to get wounded in battle. you gonna you got to come to Jesus to heal that snake bite when the serpent maybe tempts you and you give into that temptation, come to Jesus, confess your sin, you're right back in fellowship. When it came to your salvation, it was this, the same thing. You know, you got bit by sin, you came to Jesus Christ, the serpent on a pole, and you were healed of your sin eternally. So they, uh, the children of Israel got bit by the fiery serpents and so God tells Moses to put a serpent on a pole and tells them to just look at that serpent on a pole. It says in, Mo in Numbers 21, 9, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now remember this verse in the New Testament. In John three fourteen it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus became the serpent on the pole for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The symbol for medicine and healing today is a serpent wrapped around a pole. You see it on ambulances and stuff. The world can't get around the Bible. In chapter 22, you got Balaam's ass. And... This is where you have a talking animal in the Bible. Now, a talking ass, a talking donkey. Who copied that? All I know who. Shrek, the movie Shrek had the talking donkey. Don't be ashamed to open your mouth for God. Any jackass can do it. I mean, if that jackass can open his mouth for God, you should be able to open your mouth for God. Remember that in spiritual warfare as well. You know, if God can use a donkey, he can use you. You know, you think, well, I'm just an idiot. I'm a jackass. I can't do anything right. I mean, God used a donkey, and that donkey got put in the Bible. He just did what God said. God just wants you to do what he says, and that's how you will survive in spiritual warfare. And this is your Sunday School lesson for today, and I hope it's helped you out.